<laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen Salinas, and I'm the program manager of the Brentwood Arts Center. I thank you and welcome you to our virtual auditorium for BAC's Conversation on Art series with our host, Meg Linton, and guest artist, Flora Cow. Our executive director, Amy Gantman, regrets that she can't be here today, but joins me in welcoming you. Brentwood Art Center's success is due to our incredible and generous board of directors, leadership council, donors, staff, faculty, and students who support the BAC through thick and thin. And I want to thank our anonymous donor who has made the Conversations on Art series possible for the next 12 months. We can only do all that we do because of our generous donors who believe everyone should have access to the arts and education. We'd like to be sure to mention that the new BAC campus in Santa Monica, uh, located at 1625 Olympic Boulevard, is open and fall classes have begun. The campus is in close pro proximity to 18th Street, Crossroads School, and a metro stop is nearby. We are excited to offer in-person classes once again, so your contributions and enrollments in our courses are more important than ever. Our host, Meg Linton, and BAC Executive Director Amy Gantman met at Otis College of Art and Design while Meg was the Director of Exhibitions for the Ben Maltz Gallery, and Amy was the Dean of Continuing Education. The divisions collaborated on many public programs, and we're, we are thrilled to bring Meg's love and respect for artists to the BAC. Meg has been visiting artist studios for over 20 years in various roles as director and curator of contemporary art spaces in Southern California. Currently, Meg is lead producer on a documentary film about feminist performance art in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 1980s called Acting Like Women, directed by Sherry Galke. She's working on an exhibition about the artist Keith Julius Puccinelli that opens September 2024 at UC Santa Barbara writing a novel, and of course, conversing with Flora for BAC this afternoon. Welcome, Meg. Thank you, Kathleen. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the BAC, our anonymous donor, and to everyone working behind the scenes who makes this program possible. Um, welcome to Conversations on Art and our virtual studio visit with Flora Cow. Before I introduce our guest, I have the usual housekeeping. We are recording today's presentation and we ask that you please mute your microphones and turn off your video. It helps avoid any feedback or distortion with the video. During the conversation, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and I will either work them into the conversation or I'll ask them at the end of the talk. In the chat box, you'll also see that I've put some additional information about the artist um, for you to peruse on your own. And there's also instructions on how to save the chat box. So you can look at it later. Before I get into my introduction of Flora, I wanted to also let you know that, um, you know, during COVID, we, we created this conversation series online in lieu of being able to go to artist studios and, We've had a great following, so we're gonna continue our conversations online into 2024, but we've also decided to experiment by doing an in-person studio visit day on October 14th. And we're gonna be in the Venice Beach area. We're gonna visit Kim Schoenstatt, Linda King, and we're gonna meet Blue McWright over at her, at Craig Call Gallery for her solo exhibition. And she's gonna give us a private walkthrough on the last day of our show. So if you want to attend, please go to the BAC website and you can register. Um, this We only have slots for 12 students. So it's a very small kind of intimate group and um, it should be really fun. So please sign on if you can. So to our program today, using fabric, oil stick, twine, paper, and a whole other materials, Flora Cow creates poetic and expansive installations to explore relationships between humans and their environment. Her varied interests in architecture, technology, land development, development, mapping, and translation lead her into vast rabbit holes where she digs deep to find her inspiration. Often it's at the very edge of intention and accident. The techniques she employs are crochet, origami, photography, mark making, like taking a rubbing from a grave marker or a side of a building. She employs whatever other processes she needs to convey the essence of memories, both lost and found, and turning these histories into memorials. With that, welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for inviting me to share, Meg. 
Yeah, we're thrilled you're here. So um, we're just going to dig in. If I can get this going. There we go. We wanted to start with just a couple shots of uh, Flora's workspace, which it's your stairway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I make my art pretty much anywhere and everywhere. I haven't had a dedicated studio space for the past five years due to um, kind of life transitions. And um, I'm working in the stairwell, in my dining room, on the table, the kitchen table, um, and, you know, making little things while I supervise my kids' uh, <laughs> piano practice, or I'm waiting for them, you know, in their gymnastics class, I'm working on my car, <laughs> just yeah. wherever, wherever the atomized um time chunks appear in my life as I have two young children. That's awesome. We had Audrey Chan on a while back and she does the exact same thing. Wherever she can work, she works. So we wanted to launch in with this body of work and you wanted to, this Borges quote kind of sets up your thinking about the project. Yeah, in my in my art, I'm thinking very much about mapping and um, making records of um, structures that are about to disappear. Um, and so I'm very inspired by kind of these poetic turns in literature um, and how they resonate with my work. And this is a project called Homestead that we're gonna be looking at, correct? So about 12 years ago, I fell in love with this area of um, Joshua Tree Wonder Valley where there are um, a bunch of these abandoned homesteads out in the desert. And in um, the late 1930s, the government passed um, the Small Tract Act and allowed uh, people to claim five acres of desert land by building a small structure, 12 by 16 minimum, and living there for three years. Um, and then they could claim the five acres of land as their own for paying a nominal fee of $100. And, um, you know, thousands of people took advantage of this, but soon realized that the desert was such an extreme place to live. The government didn't have to provide roads or sanitation or water. Um, and many of these homesteads were ultimately abandoned. And um, I was just amazed by this landscape where these homes seem to have dropped out, dropped in from the sky and simply collapsed. And in particular, this homestead with its single gable remaining, that triangle shape for me is um, such a evocative um, gesture of, and symbol of, um, of home. And for just that triangle to be remaining um, really made me want to um, kind of dedicate a body of work to this structure before it collapsed. And um, I decided to fly a World War II parachute over the structure um, because the Small Tract Act was originally targeted towards returning war veterans. Um, there was a belief that the desert had convalescent value um, for the respiratory diseases that they were returning with. And um, to kind of capture the light and like the powerful elements that have um, inflicted this structure's demise out in this um, landscape, this harsh landscape. So with, with these photographs, these are pretty much just straight photographs of what, what the structure looks like. And then this one, you really had kind of an intervention. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and I kept returning to this site over and over again. Um, and documenting it in different ways. Ultimately, I um, started making rubbings of the debris field. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the 
title of that um, poem yeah. from the Poetics of Space, Windhouse Abode That a Breath of Face, um, I felt like it was a perfect way to encapsulate um, kind of the my emotional connection to um, the idea of home and house, um, kind of this protective shape that starts to crumble over time. And I ended up making a rubbing of on a thousand square feet of um, parachute silk um, and displaying it um, in this way that um, echoes the precarious uh, nature of what's left of this home. So the fabric billows in the wind and it becomes a drawing that you have to experience over time as you walk through um, these fluttering panels. And the um, I brought back some rafters from the site which are used as anchors for this installation. This was at Grand Central Arts Center in okay. Santana. Yeah, and it's so nice because when you're when you're living out in the desert, because I was living out in the desert for a few years, you know, that wind just comes through and it's amazing how it just destroy, you know, it can destroy any structure. Um, and so to echo that with these beautiful um, sheets of fabric is really lovely. You were saying you use oil stick for the rubbing on the fabric. Yes, um, I tried pastel and charcoal and um, before this, and then um, that material tends to just like fly away in the wind and disappear. And the oil stick I felt um, was kind of perfect. Um, and also pointing to um, kind of the asphalt and tar that, um, is the material of the roads that allow us to build out in these extreme environments. The roads and the, the rooftops, right? Because it's used yes, for yes. roofing and the tar paper and for lining and... Yeah. And you said and, this, uh, is this the parachute material? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's like a very light fabric. Yeah, I just love all the textures that you can capture in a rubbing. And I went back to the site again and made um, kind of this, documented the debris field again using um, Japanese rice paper scrolls. And so this is a rubbing on 13 of these scrolls um, to cover the entire debris field and kind of reconstructing um, the shape of the original cabin, the 12 by 16. Um, by 12 uh, so when structures. You're out, when, when you're out there working, is it, do you lay the whole thing out and do the rubbing or are you rolling the um, to go or? I'm rolling it one at a time. It's kind of a collaboration with the wind. So um, sometimes <laughs> the wind can be um, challenging. And so I, I'm definitely doing it one panel at a time. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah. and then can you take so you have these rolls would you I mean you have it in this structure here is then it is it kind of set or can you reconfigure oh yeah it can be reconfigured this? um I've I've also presented these rolls just like on a single wall kind of coming down and curling at the bottom um so most of my installations um, kind of transform over time, depending on the space that I'm installing in. They're site specific in terms of where they're made and also where they're installed. Okay. And again, these are rafters from the original um, house that are being used to create this form. Yeah, because soon those those structures will be completely gone. I, I'm pretty sure the gable is no no longer standing at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
This was from a show at Cypress College. And then um, I started doing research around the site and um, there was a trio of homesteads um, from the same kit home pattern. So there's this fallen house as well as standing versions of it. Um, and um, I documented these um, shacks in various states of disrepair and kind of created a photo essay um, for this book. And in between each um, spread is um, an essay on maps or roads or um, the desert. Um, and I was invited to do a show at the Pasadena Museum of California Art. Um, and I proposed to make rubbings of the interior and exterior walls of one of the standing um, shacks. Mm -hmm. And I installed it in the gallery space um, as four walls. And so these are some process photos. Um, I staple gunned onto the existing walls. Um, I did this when I was about five months pregnant with my daughter um, in May. So it was super hot and had to pour water on myself to stay cool. Um, Are you out there by but, yourself? Do you have No, I went with my sister. She advised okay. that we get hard hats because she was concerned about the wind. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, and, yeah. um, and do people have people come out to talk to you about what you're doing? Is there anyone out there? Um, or is it just like completely not, isolated? not when I'm making rubbings in the desert, but um, kind of in later projects where I'm making rubbings at the beach. Um, I've definitely had conversations with interested guys. There's no one really walks by here. <laughs> yeah. Night. Well, yeah. and also I just want to say, because you just sent me these books, these books are beautiful and your your writing is um, really stunning and a beautiful compliment to the visual imagery. It's really terrific. And so when you show these, when you show the actual rubbing and installation, do you show the photographs as well? Are the um, photographs I usually... Final? I do have the book. I, I do have the book in the gallery as um, kind of a, a contextual frame with the project. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there is at least one photograph of the site somewhere in this yeah. space. Yeah, I kind of, I love this photograph because you can see the home in the distance <laughs> um, through the window. But, and are the architectural yeah. plans of these homes still available? Like, can you find the original plans? Um, well, I went to the 29 Palms Historical Society and they do have kind of blueprints of um, various kit homes that were available um, with these romantic names like the Mesquite Chalet. Um, <laughs> and um, I don't know that I saw this particular uh, blueprint because it's such a simple, um, simple structure. But um, yeah, there's a wealth of information at the 29 Palms Historic Society. So much, so much rich material to dig through. And I did put together another book um, that kind of documented what I found there as well that was on display for this exhibit at the PMPA. Nice. So is this, the way it's installed, is it marked as the same? It's not the same footprint as the house, is it? It feels a little bigger. Um, it's a little bit bigger because I left corridors where you could enter um, mm -hmm. on the four corners, but it is a one-to-one -one record of the actual wall. Yeah, and I, I love the way the oil stick picks up the textures of the house and um, really kind of amplifies your experience of the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm 
And just with the oil stick, it kind of gives us this burnt feeling. Yeah. Good. Yeah, there's something very solemn about using just black so, mm -hmm. as a record. And over time, I've started to introduce color <laughs> um, as kind of as the compliment. Um, I started um, thinking about uh, Taipei, Taiwan, where my family lives. And um, there are all these traces of single family homes um, with the traditional gable um, that have been either torn down or, or built on top of um, and replaced with uh, modern apartment blocks. And so um, this shape, um, an imprint of a wall left on a modern apartment building is termed a palimpsest in um, architecture and it refers to um, um, this act in Roman times where they would reuse the vellum that they wrote on and over time um, kind of the script that was written uh, previously that had been erased would reappear on the surface of mm -hmm. um, that of the vellum. And so I started documenting these traces of traditional homes that had been torn down and replaced. And so a lot of these spaces ended up, um, kind of these ghosts of homes ended up adjacent to parking sites. And um, I documented four such sites in Taipei near my parents' house. Um, and these red brick, facades are um, traditional Taiwanese homes. And I was really intrigued by how, you know, kind of haphazardly um, the brickwork was laid and um, this evidence of the human hand um, just really appealed to me. And I would return to these sites um, multiple days in the early morning because it was August and like 100 degrees and 90% oh, humidity and um, kind of document um, with video as well as photos, um, you know, small details on the site and also just the way people moved through the site. You could hear the sounds of construction and I presented a multi-channel um, installation, video installation. So each wall is a different site. And um, it's it's like 10 second um, shots on a single detail, but you can see the bugs crawling or the wind blowing or hear passing cars. And, um, and kind of, because it's all cycling, um, it kind of captures this um, kind of schizophrenic, um, gap in mm -hmm. um, sense of absence um, that um, memorializes these traditional homes that no longer exist. Did you did you talk to anybody that kind of is around? Do they oh yeah um, notice these spaces or did I, they know someone who lived there mm -hmm. or have they been well, there so long enough that the generations have just I think people people are very used to seeing these um, forms. So I definitely befriended the parking lot attendants and <laughs> started chatting with them, but I didn't find out as much historical information as I did at the desert site. Yeah. Um, and these kind of concrete shapes are the remnants of um, traditional Japanese colonial homes, which were made from paper and wood. And so all that's left of those is just like this, you know, house shape on a concrete wall. Mm -hmm. And again, I made a book um, with all the photos and interspersed our essays, um, kind of rememberings of my family history and also um, like a short explanation of architectural history in Taipei. And Taipei is kind of a contested space, right? It's had lots of transition and 
Yeah, I mean, Taiwan um, has been a colony of many nations over the centuries. So the Dutch, um, the Spanish, the Japanese, um, the Chinese um, have all um, had times where they were in control of um, the island. And um, yeah, it's definitely and still contested. Um, so I decided to, of course, make a rubbing of this silhouette. Um, I just showed up one day with a truck full of scaffolding. Um, I did, I did get the parking lot attendance blessing for this project, but um, um, but, nobody sister, else's. My, yeah, <laughs> but nobody else's. Yeah, but nobody else's parking lot attendant was kind of fabricating explanations for interested passerbys, telling them, you know, <laughs> we're making a backdrop for a movie shoot. Um, he was just, yeah, I think he was just excited about, you know, his kind of daily routine being. <laughs> A little like something bit, new um, to watch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Being interrupted by this art project. And so this is a 45 foot long uh, rubbing in multiple panels. And I was able to roll them up and bring them back to the States and show, show them here in LA. Um, kind of this record of my family's homeland. Hmm. It's it's rare for me to have enough space to show the full piece. So this is a 25 foot version that I showed at um, a power plant in Redondo Beach. And then how tall is it? Um, it's 17 feet mm. tall. So yeah, so it that does was... kind of limit your space. Yeah. The shape of the original home, but as I mentioned, I can always reinstall in different configurations. So sometimes, yep. you know, it's one long wall, but I'll go around a corner because that's what's available in the space. Mm -hmm. The detail is beautiful. Yeah, for me, um, when I'm making these rubbings. Um, there's an element of surprise. Like, I don't know exactly what kind of marks are gonna appear. And that really keeps me um, coming back. Like this, there's definitely an element of delight as I'm making um, and recording um, the texture of a place. Um, I did a residency at Shaolong Cultural Center in Tainan, which um, was the original capital of um, Taiwan. Um, and it was established by the Dutch colonialists in um, the 1600s. And I fell in love with this structure at the cultural center. It was originally a storehouse for sugarcane, um, a Japanese colonial sugarcane processing plant. And um, this ficus tree was, has, taken over the storehouse and is just um, growing out of the roof and the roots have overtaken the brick. And I really love um, exploring our relationship to nature and um, the way architecture and nature uh, start to collapse over time. And for me, um, documenting this storehouse was a great way to visually explore that theme. Mm -hmm. Well, and just reclaiming that space. Nature yeah. Reclaiming that space. History kind of correcting itself. Yeah. And so this, I made a rubbing of all four sides of the exterior of this structure. So it's, it's, my work is very um, kind of direct. You know, I just show up with a ladder and fabric and start, you know, rubbing, making, making a record. And um, so this is, you know, when you put all four walls together, it becomes 35 feet long. 
Are there adjustments that you're making while you're doing the rubbing? Like it's it's very rules based. So I'm just yep. like making a rubbing the way you would or with a penny, except doing it on a much larger scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I'm doing is trying to keep the fabric, you know, straight. <laughs> Do people ever want to come and help you? No, I mean, I have, <laughs> I have roped in my, my family to help me, but passerbys usually don't want to get so messy. I'm, I'm usually <laughs> covered in oil paint afterwards. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Yeah, but I love the way the kind of network of the roots um, starts to take over the grid. Yeah, they feel like veins or kind of roads or highways through the, the imagery. So is this a different installation then? So this is the installation at Shaolong Cultural Centers. This is the interior, the other side. So you can still see the rubbing. So the image before that was the front of the wall. And um, oh, I if see. you go underneath, if you go behind, that's what it looked like. They, oh. they had seating back there. And um, Chris Pate, it was four artists from LA that were mm -hmm. doing residencies at the same time. So Chris Pate had um, an installation on either side of this kind of tunnels. Very cool. And um, I, I combined these rubbings from the palimpsest in Taipei, taking root in Tainan, and um, a garden wall um, that is adjacent to the site of my grandfather's home, my grandparents' mm -hmm. home, which was demolished after my grandfather passed away. I combined these three rubbings in a solo show at the LA Artists Association. Wow. And um, for me, I think I'm attracted to um, I'm attracted to these palimpsests and these ghosts of traditional homes because they're stand-ins for my grandparents' house, which no longer exists, and it becomes an anchor and kind of a site for mourning and memorial mm -hmm. um, for a place that that no longer exists, and um, for me, the show was very much about, um, you know, what does it mean to combine um, traces from disparate locations and put them adjacent to each other? And how does that kind of add and change to the experience and meaning of the work? Um, yeah, so rubbings from the north, the south, and the east parts of Nice. And, and then you've also worked with vinyl tubing. Yes, so crochet, or um, my version of crochet by a person that doesn't know the real rules of crochet, um, <laughs> hand crochet, has become a big part of my practice. And I started, um, Sorry, beeping. Um, I started uh, working with this material um, shortly after my grandfather, my maternal grandfather passed away. Um, he had been in the ICU um, for a month. And while I was waiting for my turn to see him, I was knitting this super mm. long scarf for no particular reason. Um, but when I saw this vinyl tubing, it reminded me of the IV tubes and intubation tubes I encountered um, while waiting for him. And um, for me, it was such a traumatic experience to witness his suffering. He was mostly blind, mostly deaf, intubated, restrained, um, and yet, you know, we knew he was conscious and in pain and to witness that suffering and, you know, 
to be unable to do anything about it was um, very powerful. And when he passed away, I wasn't able to go back to Taiwan for his funeral. And um, for me, I think crocheting this huge cocoon was my way of um, making a memorial to honor him. And um, projected through this form is whited out video of um, ash and smoke rising from incense burning in the ancestor worship uh, rituals that occur, um, you know, monthly, kind of daily throughout Taipei. Um, it's like the ancestor worship rituals um, in Taiwan kind of anchor the experience of the place. What are some of those rituals? Um, so uh, families will burn uh, ghost money um, to honor the dead. And to um, the idea is that when you burn this paper money, um, which is gilded uh, gold or silver, um, it is transferred to the afterlife for um, the departed loved ones spend in the afterlife. Um, and they also uh, will set out offerings of food um, on um, kind of the equivalent of the Day of the Dead um, in Taiwan, but um, there's a ghost month, which is the entire lunar uh, month of July. They'll, they'll set out offerings of food um, for um, the ghosts that um, might be uh, around while the gates are open for that whole month for the dead to kind of visit um, the living. Um, and they'll also, um, you know, burn incense as well. Um, one thing I remember about my grandfather's garden is that um, possibly because he was mostly blind, he would overtie his bougainvillea like overzealously. So with this hot pink twine, um, it's a packaging twine that's commonly used in Taiwan. And um, shortly after his passing, I decided to um, blindfold myself um, and put myself in his shoes um, and start wrapping a bougainvillea plant. So this kind of became a performance, um, like a private performance um, that I documented in video and later performed at LACE as well. Um, LA Contemporary Exhibitions. Um, so I just kept wrapping the bougainvillea while blindfolded until the entire ball of twine was used up. So um, kind of became this gesture of um, binding and restricting this living thing um, um, that has thorns and is, you know, pricking me and, and um, did you, at first, at, at first, where you probably were kind of clumsy, but then did you start to get into a rhythm? You yeah. Know, you, blind, you could. Yeah, you could I mean. Kind of epiphanies it, going through that experience that you set up for yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very meditative, um, but you still have to um, kind of anchor yourself um, because you're just going in circles for you know, over an hour. Um, I suppose there is some sort of um, kind of transcendental uh, moment as well, because um, as an artist, I'm so dependent on my vision um, and to have that, to not be able to use that um, really changes um, my experience of, of the present. And did you, uh, did you feel connected to him? Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, making the crocheted vinyl piece and starting to work in this, um, work with this packaging twine definitely was um, excellent art therapy. And so I kind of conflated the crochet 
and the bougainvillea um, over time. And um, the crochet has become a kind of part of my vocabulary of grieving and processing loss. So. Where was this it, installation? This installation was at Boston Court Theater um, in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. I was invited to make work for a show there in their space. So um, the packaging twine is like the color of pink is so, um, it's so attractive and artificial and sweet. And um, it's really interesting to kind of push it and transform it to create this environment that one can walk into. And when I make my installations, I'm very much interested in the moment of encounter, kind of creating a space for reflection and uh, uh, reflection on one's experience and relationship to architecture. This piece um, is titled For You Who I Will Never Know, and it is a response to and meditation on the three miscarriages I had. Um, between my first and second child and um, it was it was you know really therapeutic and to um, be able to sweep up all this fallen bougainvillea from different locations around town and you know to be like crying while I'm sweeping and um, kind of create this experience at LA Contemporary Exhibitions at least. Um, and it was part of a one night show organized by Deborah Oliver, Irrational Exhibits. And there were um, you know, various perform performers um, that started to kind of utilize this space as well. So that was really interesting and something I wanna incorporate more of in the future to um, you know, work with dancers and performers in these environments that I be a nice collaboration. Yeah. Um, this piece um, is titled Bound and it's a response to uh, my husband's words, my love for you has shriveled up and died uh -huh. um, about five years ago. Um, you know, my husband uh, told me he had met someone and he was leaving and I kind of was in this state of grief and shock for six months and um, and this is the first work that I made after that period of you know just surviving and and um, and kind of being able to move beyond um, that dark period um, of, um, insomnia and not being able to really function. Um, and, um, there's four bougainvillea for, um, him, me, and our two children. And, um, thinking about how, um, you know, despite this turn of events that we're still connected and bound together in Chinese culture, um, there's a uh, belief in uh, the, the red string of fate. So people or um, people who are meant to meet in significant ways are connected by this red string of fate. And so for me, um, you know, this packaging twine became a way to kind of work through um, a new loss, but probably mm -hmm. the most significant. Well, and when you're going through loss, you know, you become, your focus narrows in so much and to be able to have this physical process and activity of this small gesture and making then something grand and monumental is really beautiful as it builds. Yeah, I think um, kind of meditative acts of mm -hmm. uh, 
of beauty have become very significant, like these small gestures of creating something bigger. And um, during the pandemic, I was about six months into the pandemic, I was invited to um, be part of the Jordan and Ray, we are here, here we are um, project where um, artists were invited to kind of guerrilla install public art since um, all galleries were closed. And so I installed um, two Bougainvillea and wrapped the same barrier um, on the canal in my neighborhood. And um, this piece was Venice only- Venice Canals, correct? Yes, yes, Venice yeah. Canals, a beautiful place. Um, this, this piece was only up for a week before it was taken down. So then I decided to install it under a bridge because I thought, you know, it's going to be really hard to take down my art if I put it under a bridge. And the only <laughs> way you can get it is by boat. And um, there was kind of another uh, call for public art. And so I decided to propose to include this in Made in LA. And I collaborated with Mike Saijo. We each took an alcove under the bridge and installed our work. And um, we would row out, um, you know, people who are interested in seeing the work up close um, as oh, yeah. part of Made in LA. So, you know, it becomes an experience of getting on the boat, um, you know, seeing the reflections of the water uh, under the bridge and, um, being really in tune with nature. Oh, me. there we go. And then it, you and went and found a park. Yes, a so or a park or? this is actually at Plummer Park in um, West Hollywood. And I just installed this um, a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, so even though a lot of my work kind of is inspired by you know personal loss or um, you know personal connections um, to places or things or materials. It kind of you know moves beyond that, and so mm -hmm. I installed this um, hot pink net um, under four trees at Palmer Park, and um, it really transformed. Um, I think the daily experience of the park. Is it still um, up? You said you did this recently? It was interesting. No, no, it was just a one day show. Mm -hmm. I always say I'm not going to do any more one day shows and then I end up doing it anyway. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't say no. If someone gives me a big space, I just have to say yes. Yeah, so it's kind of almost like a dragon, you know, stretching through the trees and kind of this undulating experience. If you um, go on my Instagram, I think I posted a little video of kind of walkthrough. Oh, nice. Um, and um, this piece uh, is titled Tree of Life. And um, I made it uh, in response to the Black Lives Matter um, protests during the pandemic. Um, I actually had a, um, these branches from an olive tree that, um, that had been butchered in the middle of the night. It belonged to my neighbors and it was so beautiful. And I loved like waking up and seeing it, you know, outside my window and one night it had been cut down. And when my neighbors yeah. were getting rid of the olive branches um, that were left, I asked for them and I had them sitting in my garage for months. And during the protest, I had this epiphany that I would um, bandage the branches in a rainbow of skin tones. Um, mm -hmm. So using silk that I salvaged from, I dumpster dove for the silk. So, um, um, and kind of, thinking about the, the tree of life and how we all come from the same tree um, to create this kind of healing gesture. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I made this companion piece um, titled Prayer Tree. So it's kind of this gesture that's common in many cultures, in Irish, Native American, Japanese uh, cultures. They all will take, um, you know, a swath of fabric and tie it on a tree branch and make a wish. Um, so I'm using the, these materials and, you know, wishing for peace and understanding. Yeah. Um, when my grandmother passed away, my paternal grandmother passed away, um, I kind of elaborated on this gesture using bamboo um, in, and I tied on swaths of fabric um, that were uh, the sacred colors um, worn by Buddhist monks. And so each time I'm tying a fabric, it's a wish for peace in the face of loss. Um, so this was kind of my memorial piece for my grandmother. And um, using bamboo, um, bamboo in Buddhist culture or Chinese culture is a symbol for resilience and perseverance and um, What's been the response to some of this work? Um, I think people are are very moved by kind of this poetic gesture, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get I get really good responses to my installations and it's nice to share kind of these. Do people open up and share their stories with you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially um, kind of in these next pieces where I'm really delving into loss um, and Buddhist um, kind of sources. Mm -hmm. um, people have definitely shared their own stories of loss with me. So in, um, in Taiwanese, the word for fishnet and the word for hope our homonyms, hibong, um, and I started crocheting in this um, kind of beautiful golden yellow uh, color um, in Buddhist Taiwanese culture. Um, this yellow is um, a symbol of the sun and enlightenment and freedom, and it's commonly used on um, altars um, and deathbeds. Um, and so when my paternal grandfather um, had returned home from the hospital after you know, many months um, at the hospital um, on the ventilator, um, he returned home for hospice um, and his deathbed was draped in this yellow color as well. And um, this piece is kind of, you know, um, a meditation on rebirth and transcendence after um, this long period of grief and isolation um, in my personal life, but it's also a memorial to my paternal as well. Yeah. Um, so it was the first piece I showed after pandemic and everything reopened yeah um, and then if you yeah. move more if you're still kind of using this color yeah still working with this beautiful golden yellow um so this piece kind of directly translates um kind of the drapes of the altar and deathbed into um an experience you can walk through um it's titled becoming um in buddhist tradition you know we're constantly in a state of becoming constantly in a state of transition um and i installed this at the redondo beach historic library about a month ago and um there's a buddhist chant um playing as well 
um, Amitofo, um, which means uh, Buddha of Immeasurable Light, Immeasurable Life, um, with the bells um, and the hubby. We only we only have about four or five minutes left, Laura. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. Um, so I this, wanted to talk about this video. Yeah. So um, finally, this footage is from my um, Origami Lotus series, um, and it's this video was recently installed at LA Louvre. Um, it's titled Pier, and so in traditional Taiwanese culture. Um, when a loved one passes away, um, devoutly Buddhist families actually fold 108 origami lotus every week um, for seven weeks, and they burn 108 origami lotus every week for seven weeks until the cremation on the 49th day. And um, I used footage from my grandfather's uh, morning rituals um and projected it in four corners um over this giant origami lotus that i constructed uh, for a solo show at the la artist association and um the there's chants by buddhist nuns from the funeral as well mm -hmm. playing so you and can again, show it multiple configurations right because it yeah 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 And I'm, this is a shot of my desk and different corners of my house look like this. I'm currently working on an origami lotus installation that I'll show at Launch Gallery in January. The opening will be um, January 13th, 5 to 8 p.m. And um, I'll be installing um, hundreds of these origami lotus as a cloud that you can walk through. Um, and uh, I mentioned I was making rubbings in color and um, Witness is a project where I made installations or I made rubbings of different sites where I sought solace during this period of emotional turn turmoil. So Descanso Gardens, um, La Piedra Beach in Malibu and um, I installed these all together. Um, at El Camino College and thinking about- How was the change from working from black and white to color? Um, well, it's harder because you have to think about which colors, but it's also more exciting. Yeah. yeah um, but I'm definitely- making, Like, did you, you couldn't make the rubbings all in one day. So every day- Oh, I, I, I return multiple times. Yeah. And, and I can adjust the color um, and add add different colors over time as well to, you know, start making kind of thinking about it from a painterly perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm probably going to keep working on these actually. Um, and one of my most recent installations was at Angels Gate Cultural Center. I made rubbings of the Nike missile site at White Point Preserve, as well as um, the um, rocky features, geologic features of White Point Beach um, down below. Both of these sites were, were part of Fort MacArthur, um, as well as Angels Gate Cultural Center. Um, all three of these sites were part of Fort MacArthur um, in uh, post-World War II and um, after the fort was decommissioned, um, it kind of was separated into these three sites. Um, so I made this this rubbing to be installed at Angels Gate Center. So do people come up to you and ask you what you're doing? Yes, definitely. <laughs> the Rangers, um, people start talking about, you know, their friends that are artists or their daughter is an artist and um, kind of bringing in their life stories. And I really enjoy that. That's great. Yeah, and I'm currently thinking about um, making rubbings that are inspired by the color of mussel shells. Um, I might install it at John Wayne Airport in um, November, or maybe I'll show something else. We'll see. That's exciting.
Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to let us know about your shows so I can share that with our, our community. That yeah. So uh, the solo show at Launch Gallery is definitely confirmed. That's um, great. With Gabby well, Lotus installation. Laura, this has been amazing. We're at time. It goes, it always goes so quickly. <laughs> um, but this has been wonderful sharing, you know, having you share your work with us. And um, we appreciate you being here. And I just want to remind everybody we have the tour on October 14th. And then next up is Fran Siegel, who will be speaking with us in November. And then we have Siri Carr, who will be coming in December. And we hope you all will join us. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We'll see you later. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone.